Good evening, everyone. Uh, we welcome you to the last uh, meeting of day number two at the Sprague River Camp meeting. Um, I'm blessed to be um, gathered here this year um, after one year of uh, intermission, which I'm sure most of you know uh, by now why my family was not here last year, but we're glad to be gathered here with you this evening. And uh, we're looking forward to the wonderful work that Christ wants to accomplish for each and every one of us as we've come here uh, seeking an experience that will prepare us uh, not just for the time of trouble, but even uh, today and tomorrow and the days to come. Uh, so with that being said, and as we are ready to go, I want to invite you to um, reverently kneel with me in prayer um, as far as you are able to. Let us kneel and pray together for the Word of God and for the living preacher. Father in heaven, thank you for reminding us about the roses, the lilies, and the pinks, the flowers of God's love and the promises of his divine nature. Every promise has been written and confirmed in blood. That blood which was shed upon Mount Calvary as the Lamb of God expired and gave up the ghost for all of us. That we might be ransomed from the second death and that we might have a life that measures with the life of God. We pray for the Holy Spirit to abide with us uh, to reveal to us Jesus, the lily of the valley, and also the rose of Sharon. Again, we thank you for the evidences that you have placed in nature, uh, God's handiwork, the glory of God being revealed. And so we pray now that as we open the scriptures, that you would open our hearts and our minds to, again, the divine and heavenly agencies that are about us, even your angels that are walking among us, seeking to look into these things that we are studying this evening. But thank you again for gathering us, and please abide with us, I pray. For it is in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. This evening, we're turning in our Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, wanting to commence in verse number 16. Again, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 16. The Word of God says, Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example, or in sample. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Uh, this evening our message is entitled, The Enemies of the Cross of Christ. The Enemies of the Cross of Christ. Of Christ. Verse 19 actually gives us four adjectives or descriptions concerning those who are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And this was a subject that was very heavy upon the heart of Paul. Paul said that I've told you often and now even weeping. So in other words there was pain, there was heartache, there was tears, there was anguish as Paul carried the weight and responsibilities of souls 
upon his heart. He knew that God had called him to be a watchman and one that had to give an account for the souls that were under the labors of his ministry. And so before we begin to identify this evening the enemies of the cross of Christ, and we're going to do so uplifting Jesus and making him the great center of attraction in the third angel's message, just as the other men of God have come before me, particularly Elder Cunningham, even this morning in his morning man of worship service. I want you now to turn with me in your Bibles as we go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, because I do not want to uh, be remiss upon the fact that Paul gave this message with tears. He was weeping. There was a deep feeling and emotion because he had the heart of Christ for his people and actually loved the souls that he ministered to. So I want you to go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 as we look at the aspect of Paul weeping as he identified those that were not walking based upon the same rule, based upon the same type and experience that he himself demonstrated in his own practical experience and walk with God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4, and the scriptures tell us, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. So I don't want us to miss the fact that as Paul has given this message and even weeping, and perhaps even as Sister White when many times she would write testimonies uh, to the church and to specific church members and ministers, oftentimes her page would actually be stained with the tears that would fall upon the page as she was writing mingled with the ink. And so we see the great love that Paul had when it talked about how with much tears, much affliction, and he's revealing this because he wants us to see the humanity, he wants us to see the compassion, the love of God, the fruit of the Spirit being exercised. And it reminds me of what Jesus tells us in the church of the Laodiceans. He says very clearly that as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, repent. So every rebuke that comes from God must be mingled with the same self sacrificing love that was manifested by Jesus. And even as it was said earlier today by the elder, he said that if we do not have this true love in our experience, then we're not really filled with the Holy Spirit. We're not filled with the fruits of righteousness. And so I want you to go on with me as we continue to look at Paul's experience in laboring for the churches that were under his care in the book of Acts chapter 20. Go with me, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, so Paul did not hate the people that he labored for. He genuinely cared for them souls and wished them well and wanted them to be saved. Although he had to identify these enemies of the cross of Christ, they still was there with weeping, with mourning, with tears. You're really just listening, paying attention, but just really praying for God to have his way with the sound equipment, with the computers, with everything, Amen. that his angels would be with us um, as well and drive back any evil angels or unholy influences that are among us trying to distract, and trying to turn away our attention from that which is all important and that being the oracles of God. I think that everything is okay, at least from where I could tell. So we're going to Acts chapter 20. We're going to read verse number 24. Acts chapter 20 
and verse 24 is we're just simply laying a foundation this evening and we're looking at the heart of Paul, the burden, the sorrow, the care, the weeping that he had for his people. And looking at this as an example of how you and I are to be as we are ministering in word and in doctrine and handling sacred things. Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, notice what he says. This is Paul's testimony. This is his farewell meeting with the elders of the church of Ephesus. And I want you to notice what he says here, beginning in verse 24 of Acts 20. It says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with what everybody? Tears. Tears. And so we find that Paul was a faithful shepherd of the flock. He was true to his calling. Night and day for three years warning the people of God with tears. He was a watchman. He warned the people of God of the dangers that would come in after he left. Even that would be manifested among the leadership or the elders of the church of Ephesus. The Bible tells us that there were other prophets in the Bible that also had this experience. Notably, Jeremiah the prophet, who was known as the weeping prophet. Turn to Jeremiah, the 13th chapter. Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah, what chapter are we turning to? Go on to chapter 13 and verse 15. Jeremiah 13 and verse 15. So every true laborer of God, a gospel worker, a minister, a shepherd, a messenger, if his heart is really filled with the love of God, and he has the weight of souls upon his heart, there's going to be tears, there's going to be anguish, there's going to be feeling an emotion, a deep experience for the people of God. Jeremiah 13 and verse 15, it says this, Hear ye and give ear, be not proud, for the Lord hath spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God, because before he caused darkness, and before you, your feet stumble upon the dark mountains. And whilst you look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. But if you will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride. And mine eye shall weep sore and run down with tears because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. So why would Jeremiah be weeping for the people of God that would not give glory By humbling themselves and uh, walking in the light while they still had it, lest it become darkness and gross darkness in their path, he would weep in secret places for their pride. Because they refused to surrender and fall upon the rock and be broken. Notice a further description of Jeremiah's experience as the weeping prophet in the Bible. Go to Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9, let's notice the spiritual condition of the church of Israel even in the time of Jeremiah, which caused him to shed not a few tears. Jeremiah chapter 9 in verse number 1, notice his lamentations. And he was not proud, he was not excited, he was not jubilant when he beheld apostasy among his flock, but no, he would weep because he knew that if they did not humble their pride, they would be scattered. They would be carried away into captivity. They would lose their freedom, their independence, their national sovereignty as a nation. 
Jeremiah 9 verse 1 says, Oh, that my head were waters, and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them, for they be all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. And they bend their tongues like their bow for lies. But they're not valiant for the truth upon the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Take ye heed every one of his neighbor, trust ye not in any brother, for every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders, and they will deceive every one his neighbor, and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies, and weary themselves to commit iniquity. Thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. So why wouldn't the people of God speak the truth to their neighbor? Why would they walk with slanders? Why would they commit adultery? Why would they be treacherous and deceitful men? You cannot trust them. You do not want to abide with them. You rather have a shelter in the wilderness as you're weeping day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Why? The Bible says that they refuse to know me. Now, that was the root of the matter. Why they would not speak the truth. Why they were deceitful, committing adultery, walking in lies, bending their tongues for bows and lies. It's because they did not have a personal and true relationship with Jesus Christ. And this was simply the outgrowth of that reality. The Bible further tells us in the book of Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel the eighth chapter, rather, before you go to Ezekiel 8, turn with me to Joel chapter 2. The book of Joel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, chapter 2, and verse number 15. So Paul was weeping as he identified the enemies of the cross of Christ. We see the same experience with Jeremiah the prophet. And now we find even in the book of Joel chapter 2 verse number 15 what God is calling us to do in the day of a solemn assembly, this day of atonement, this investigative judgment that we're under. Joel 2.15, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should, the, should they say among the people, Where is their God? Where does Joel call the ministers to weep between the porch and the altar? What's going on in the porch, between the porch and the altar, that is so heinous, so atrocious, so hideous, so abominable, that it calls forth for weeping, even in this time of solemn assembly, as we're gathering together to be uh, sanctified, to be purified from sin. What's going on between the porch and the altar? Go with me now to Ezekiel the 8th chapter. Ezekiel, the eighth chapter, and we're looking together, starting with verse number 16. In Jeremiah chapter 8, verse number 16. Uh, rather, I'm sorry, Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16. Pardon me. Thank you. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16. We're looking at the character of the watchman. We're looking at the burden of souls that they carry upon their heart, the weight of responsibility, the tears, the weeping. It is real. It is not lovesick sentimentalism at all. But it's the same spirit that dwelt in the heart of Christ as he wept over Jerusalem, beholding the city and understanding that their destruction was nigh. Ezekiel 8, 16 says, And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, between where? Between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward what? So what's going on between the porch and the altar? 
sun worship, the, the greatest abomination, the most shameful and hateful thing. As we look at Ezekiel 8, we see that the abominations and the apostasies continue to grow and to progress and to develop until the point where there's just open sun worship. The back is turned toward the temple, signifying that we've rejected the law. We've rejected the Sabbath. We've rejected the sanctuary truth. We rejected righteousness by faith. We rejected all the pillar and foundational truths that have made us a denominated people. And when we turn our backs on the law and testimony, there's only one alternative, there's only one thing left to worship, and that is to keep the day of the sun. Sunday worship. In which, when this begins to take place in Israel, this is when God's anger and fury will be released, where he begins to pour out judgment upon his apostate people. Bible further tells us here in Ezekiel chapter 9, though, what should be our attitude? Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 4, what should be our attitude when we confront apostasy? Worldly conformity. New theology is preached among us. Babylonian doctrines are accepted among us. Policy is chosen over principle. Worldliness prevails. Our church looks more worse than the churches of Babylon. What should be our attitude and behavior as we see these things taking place? Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 4, it says, And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, go through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. If we do not have this experience of sighing and crying for the abominations that are taking place, not just in the church, but among families, in among, among homes, in communities, we don't have this experience of sighing and crying for not only what's taking place in the church and in the world, but mourning over our own spiritual declension. Then we're going to be left without the seal of God. And we cannot turn on these tears. We cannot manufacture or drum up sorrow for what we see taking place. It has to be the Spirit of God moving upon our hearts, motivating the sighing and the, and, the, and the crying that takes place among His people. Another thought on this in Psalm 119 as we move along. Psalm 119, and looking at verse 136, we often wonder, well, how can I weep, and how can I mourn, and how can I sigh and cry? I don't know how to do this. Well, the secret is, is that we have to be working for souls, laboring to lead them into truth. Because truly, if we're working for souls, if we're doing in-reach and outreach, and we become connected with the people, our interest is bound up with them, then this will produce the experience that we need in order to sigh and to cry. The reason why we have no tears to shed really is because we're selfish. We're covetousness. Our, our hearts are hard and we become callous, desensitized to what's taking place around us in our churches and in our homes. We're not laboring for people. But the Bible says in Psalm 119, 136, it tells us, rivers of water run down mine eyes because they do not what? They're not keeping the law. Is this our experience as we see the law of God trampled under the dust? And not just among worldlings, but even among professed Sabbath keepers. As the law of God is held most in contempt, rivers should be pouring out because of those that are not keeping the law. Not, not in pointing the finger, not in simply trying to condemn them, but really having the heart of Christ and really weeping and being sorrowful for the enemies of the cross of Christ. And Paul tells us in Philippians 3 that there are four characteristics, four ways that you can tell whether or not someone is an enemy of the cross of Christ. Bible tells us, first of all, whose end is destruction. So we know that if we're an enemy of the cross of Christ this evening, our end is going to be destruction, not eternal life. 
Number two, it says, whose God is their belly. Number three, the Bible says, their glory is in their shame. And number four, they mind earthly things. Four characteristics to identify who are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Let's go on our Bibles now to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Whose end is destruction. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Most of us here this evening under this tent, if someone said to you that you are an enemy of the cross of Christ, you oppose the cross of Christ, you fight against the cross of Christ and its influence, all of us would be mortified and horrified and would be denying. Not me, Lord, not me, Lord. But I want us to take a deep look into Scripture tonight to see whether or not we're enemies of the cross of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. What does it mean to be an enemy of the cross of Christ? We just mentioned these four points. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning here in verse number 17. The Bible says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. I want you to notice that when we look at the cross of Christ, this actually is a dividing line between two personalities, two types of characters, two types of worshipers. Just like on Calvary, Jesus was crucified between the two thieves. One of those thieves was saying, remember me, Lord, when you come in your kingdom, representing the righteous and the faithful. The other said, hey, why don't you come down from off that cross and save us and yourselves? The cross of Christ is that which divides the two classes of individual. In this particular text, it says, to those that are perishing, the cross of Christ is foolishness. But to those that are saved, it is the power of God. Let's continue on in verse 19. It says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Where is the power and wisdom of God located? And not just in Christ, but Christ and him crucified in his cross. This is where the power unto salvation lies. This is where true victory and freedom from sin is available for us. Not in any other, but in the cross of Christ. To the Jews, it was a stumbling block. To the Greeks, it was foolishness. The world by wisdom knew not God. Worldly wisdom. Is that which makes of none effect the cross of Christ. And when you're making of none effect the cross of Christ through worldly wisdom, what do you end up doing to Christ, which makes you an enemy? You crucify him. Look at chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, chapter 2. Let's look at verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6, it says, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have done what? Crucified the Lord of glory. And so we're seeing that through the principles of false education or worldly wisdom that that makes of none effect the cross of Christ, the law and the gospel leads us to put to death Jesus 
on the cross. The Bible says, whose end is destruction. I want you to go with me to the book of Job, J-O-B, chapter 20. Job chapter 20, or rather verse, rather chapter 21, pardon me, Job 21 and verse number 7. Job chapter 21 and verse number 7, talking about the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction. Bible says, beginning in verse 7 of Job 21, Wherefore do the righteous live? We're just making sure we're all together. Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? Their seed is established in their sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull gendereth and faileth not, their cow cavilleth and casteth not her calf. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They take the timbrel and harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave. Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit should we have if we pray unto him, if ever there was an enemy of the cross of Christ? It's found among those that are prospering, those that are wealthy, those that are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Because of their prosperity, the Bible says that they say to God, depart from us. We don't desire the knowledge of your ways. What profit should I have if I serve him? Why should I pray unto God? Let's continue on. Verse 16 says, Lo, their good is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. How oft is the candle of the wicked Put out. How oft cometh their destruction upon them? God distributed sorrow in his anger. It's interesting that the Bible talks about the candle of the wicked being put out. Can you think of a parable that is associated with virgins, lamps, vessels, oil, and light? One class of virgins ask the others and say, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. This is the candle of the wicked or the lamp of the wicked that's going to be extinguished. They have not the oil in their vessels or in their lamps. Verse 18 it says, they are as stubble before the wind and as chaff that the storm carrieth away. God layeth up his iniquity for his children, he rewardeth him and he shall know it. His eye shall see his destruction and he shall drink of the wrath of the Almighty. So how does the Bible describe the destruction of the wicked? To those that say to God, depart from us, we don't want the knowledge of your ways. We don't want to serve you. We don't want to pray unto you. How does the Bible describe their destruction? What are they going to drink? Bible tells us in verse number 20 that they're going to drink the wrath of the Almighty. Now that's a very terrible death, to drink the wrath of the Almighty God. Who does the Bible describe as those that are going to have to drink the wine of the wrath of God? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation, what chapter did we say? We said chapter 14 and we're going to verse number 9. The Bible told us concerning the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction. And the Bible is describing their destruction as that which is represented by drinking the wrath of the Almighty. There's only one class of individuals that have to drink this wrath of God. What does one have to do to be a candidate to have to drink the wrath of the Almighty God? Or be wicked. Yes. That which Jesus himself drunk symbolically in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
tasting death for every man and offering to us the cup of salvation and the cup of blessing. We refuse that, and now we want to drink the very cup that Jesus himself already drunk for us. Never wanted us to experience the wrath of God, the plagues of God, the second death, as it were, the experience of being in the lake of fire and brimstone. Revelation 14, verse 9, the third angel warns us, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the what? wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So what does one have to do in order to drink the wine of the wrath of God? What do you have to receive? The mark of the beast. Worship the beast and his image. And reject the third angel. Refuse the seal of God. And it's interesting. I never thought about this until now. But in verse number 10 as we read. The Bible tells us again. That they're going to be tormented with fire and brimstone. In the presence of the holy angels. And in the presence of the lamb. Question is why do they have to experience this torment? This weeping and wailing, this anguish, this destruction that was really prepared for the devil and his angels. Why must they experience this in the presence of the Lamb? You ever consider that? They refused him. And when we think of the Lamb, what is brought to view when we think of the Lamb? When Jesus is presented in the Bible as the Lamb. We think of the sacrifice. We think of the cross of Christ. In other words... Those that get the mark of the beast, these are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And so they're going to be destroyed in the presence of the Lamb. As a matter of fact, this is what Psalms 2 says. Go to Psalms chapter 2 with me, or the second division of Psalms. Go with me there to Psalms 2, the second division. And we're looking together in verse number 6. Excuse me. We could begin in verse number one, Psalms chapter two and verse number one. Notice that they have to do it in the presence of the lamb because they rejected the cross of Christ, the salvation which was proffered them so that they would not have to receive the mark of the beast. Don't you understand that this is the reason why Jesus died for you and I to save us from this wrath, to save us from eternal separation, to save us from drinking the cup of his indignation. That's why the lamb was slain for us. But they're going to have to do this in his presence as a reminder that they've rejected him, that they were his enemies and fought against him. The mark of the beast is that which will come upon the enemies of the cross of Christ. Psalms 2 verse 1 says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together and against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his what? Wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And it's interesting that in the book of Hebrews chapter 1 as it comments and Paul draws from Psalms 2 he says sit thou here on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. That's very significant, significant language. When do the enemies of the cross, cross of Christ become his footstool? Well when he becomes king. And when does Jesus go from being priest to king? When does Jesus change his office from being a priest after the order of Melchizedek 
to now being king of kings and lord of lords, when does he begin to reign? When Michael stands up. And what happens when Michael stands up? No more intercession. How do we know that? Because the temple of God is filled with smoke. And that's signifying that probation is closed. The wrath of God in the seven last plagues begin to fall upon who? But not just the wicked. Those that have the mark of the beast, specifically. Those that are partakers of the sins of Babylon. Those that are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And so he comes again, and the Bible describes how he's going to come back and his garments will be stained in red because he treadeth the winepress alone, the winepress of the wrath of the Almighty God. And their blood is sprinkled upon his garments because they're his footstool. They're his enemies. The Bible tells us whose end is destruction, but also whose God is their belly. And we're going to introduce you to a, another God this evening. A God that most people would like to ignore or deny, but a God that is worshipped by many, but acknowledged by very few. Whose God is their belly. What does that mean? We're talking about the enemies of the cross of Christ, and they're serving a God, but it's their own belly. Go with me to the book of Romans. Romans, the 16th chapter. Romans chapter 16, so we're already identifying that those who are the enemies of the cross of Christ are those that are going to get the mark of the beast. They're rejecting the third angel's message, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Paul understood this, and this is why he was weeping. This is why he had tears. This is why he had deep sorrow, feeling, and emotion, compassion upon the lost, but not just in the world, but also in the church. Romans 16, beginning in verse 17, the Bible tells us, we can see that this was a theme of the messages of the Apostle Paul to the churches. Romans 16, 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and do what? Avoid, Avoid them. Now we're going to come back to this. Who are those that cause divisions and offenses? contrary to the doctrine who you received, or that which you received. It says you need to mark them and avoid them. That's pretty strong language there. How are divisions and contentions caused among God's people? We're going to come back to that. But let's continue on in verse 18. The Bible says, For they that are such, who are the they? Who are we talking about? Those that are causing divisions and offenses. Contrary to the doctrine that you received. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own what? Their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So what kind of individuals are these? They cause divisions, offenses, they're deceivers. How do they deceive? by their fair speeches and their good words. So in other words, we're, we're not just talking about any individuals, we're talking about those that are preachers, those that are teachers, those that are messengers. This can apply to myself. Because I don't, I don't preach things that I'm not bound by. If I'm preaching something and teaching something in the Word of God, I have to examine myself first. So we're talking about those that through their good words and fair speeches, they're deceiving the hearts of the simple. They're not serving Christ. They're the enemies of the cross of Christ. They're serving their own belly as their own God. And they cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine that's been received. Now, and they deceive the hearts of the simple. Now, who are the simple in the Bible? What does the Bible mean concerning the simple? Only the simple are being deceived here. The babes. In a sense, we could say the babes. But let's 
turn over to Proverbs. I guess we need to qualify that because simple can be either positive or negative. But in this sense, the simple here is not negative. Or rather, the simple here is not positive. Because there's the simplicity of the gospel of Christ. But we're talking about simple individuals who are really gullible. They're beguiled. They're easily deceived and led away of strange and false doctrines. And when they receive them, it causes them to oppose the cross of Christ. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. Go to Proverbs chapter 1 with me. Who are the simple that are deceived by these good words and fair speeches? Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 20. Listen to what it says. Proverbs 1 and verse 20. The Bible says, Wisdom crieth without she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse. In the opening of the gates in the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. So what kind of simplicity are we talking about here? This, isn't, this is not the simplicity in Christ that you want to have, this simplicity leads you to be a scorner, a mocker, a hater, a fool, one that rejects and despises knowledge. The Bible goes on to say in verse 23, Turn you at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, I will make known my words unto you. Here the Lord is trying to do a work in giving his people the experience of the former and latter rain, but they have to turn at his reproof. But we're going to find that they don't turn at his reproof. They reject the reproof. Therefore, the Spirit of God is not poured upon them. And as a result, they don't understand his word. Verse 24, it says, Because I've called and ye refuse, I've stretched out my hand and no man regard it. Now hold on a second. How did God, how did God call here? Don't blow by this here. Verse 24, because I've called and ye refuse, I've stretched out my hand and no man regarded. How did, how did God stretch out his hand? Where did he stretch out his hand as he was calling to repentance? Where did he stretch out his hand? At the cross. He stretched out his hand for us. And yet no man regarded it. Bible says in verse 25, but you have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. What counsel is connected with the reproof of God, which if you would receive the reproof that God gives to in love, he'd be able to pour out his spirit unto you and make known his words unto you. What counsel is being despised here and rejected? Is this not the counsel of the true witness, the straight testimony to the Laodiceans that's despised and rejected? Bible goes on to say in verse 26, I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. What experience is this when we go to seek God, but we can't find him? We call upon him, but he doesn't answer us. This is when probation is closed. The Holy Spirit is grieved. By doing what? How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? And how do we close probation upon us? Rejecting, Rejecting what? Christ, Christ his, his counsel, and his stretched out arm on Calvary for us. Thus we become his enemies. The Bible goes on to say in verse 29, and this is the reason why they try to seek him, but can't find him. They call upon him. He doesn't answer. Verse 29, it says, For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall do what? Destroy them, but whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. So what is it that's going to destroy the simple that are deceived by the good words and fair speeches of those that serve their own belly and not Jesus Christ? 
What destroys them? It says the turning away of the simple will slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. What type of prosperity destroys the fools? That which causes them not to receive the counsel and the reproof. Worldly prospering. Turn with me to Luke chapter 16. I agree with that. Luke 16. Turn with me there to Luke chapter 16 as we're coming to a close this evening. Luke chapter 16. Or rather, not Luke chapter 16, pardon me, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 beginning in verse 15. Listen to what it says, Luke chapter 12 verse 15. What type of prosperity? We say worldly prosperity. Notice in verse 15 it says, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of what, everybody? Covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain poor man, a certain rich man, brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat. Drink and be what? What do we find here? A belly God worshiper. All right. What else? Ease and pleasure. Woe to them that are ease in Zion. The prophet Amos tells us. Selfishness. Thinks he has everything. Covetousness. He says, I have all these fruits. What, what are the fruits that... He's acquiring and that he stores up for himself. Worldly prosperity. All right. What else? What is he supposed to be doing with the fruits that? Sharing. That's right. Sharing. How do we share the blessings of God? By the gospel. In other words, we're talking about the riches of the gospel, the treasures of salvation here that this rich man has but he keeps it all to himself let me eat and drink and be merry the Bible says enemy of the cross of Christ his God is his belly the Bible tells us look at verse 20 the Bible says, But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This rich man is an acted parable identifying the experience of the Laodicean church at the end of the world. Eat and drink and be merry. But the Bible also tells us in the book of Isaiah chapter 22, go with me to the book of Isaiah now, chapter 22. Isaiah 22 and verse number 12. The Bible speaks a lot about eating and drinking. Matter of fact, we can just have a whole Bible study just about what the Bible says about eating and drinking. It's always interesting that normally when we talk about, when the Bible describes those that were eating and drinking, it's often connected with the close of their probation or their destruction. Think about it. What was happening in the days of Noah? Eating and drinking. This is the reason why they rejected the message of, of, of Noah, the preacher of righteousness. Righteousness by faith did not come into the ark, eating and drinking. What about in the days of Lot? Uh, that, yes, that, yes, that's right. Ezekiel chapter uh, 16 verses uh, 49 to 51 talking about why Sodom was destroyed. Pride and fullness of bread did not strengthen the, the, the needy or did not work or labor for the poor. Were haughty, committed abomination, yes. What about the children of Israel? Did they have a problem with eating and drinking? Appetite and passion, yes. What about the sons of Job and Job chapter 1. When did the wind come from the wilderness and smite the four corners of the house that they were eating and drinking in 
and destroy them at the very end, Job chapter 1. So oftentimes we can just trace point by point in the Bible that oftentimes when the Bible mentions eating and drinking and not just eating and drinking, nothing wrong with that, but, but surfeiting and drunkenness as our Lord said in Luke 21 verse 34 to 36. And this is what brings upon us the snare. This is what, these are the things that allow us not to stand before the Son of Man. They're entrapments, entanglements as it were. Luke 20, uh, rather Isaiah 22 is no different. For in verse 12, Isaiah 22, verse 12, it says, And in that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to girding with sackcloth. Now, let me ask you a question. What day in Israel's economy did he call them to weeping, to mourning, to fasting? The day of atonement. So the day of atonement, afflicting the soul, making an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Not doing any servile work as it were. Abstaining from certain foods, certain diets. Reform is called for. Bible goes on to say that instead of weeping and mourning and girding with sackcloth, which sackcloth is a symbol of repentance and putting away of sin in the Bible, verse 13 says, And behold, joy and gladness slaying oxen and killing sheep eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. Who are they serving? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we're going to die. They're not eating for strength, as it were, but rather for drunkenness. What does God think about this? In the Day of Atonement, has, in the day of atonement, has God also enjoined and called upon His people? to adopt certain reforms. Health reform, diet reform, dress reform. What is the purpose of all these reforms, by the way? What do they symbolize? What do they represent? We're going to come to that in just a moment. But instead of doing this, what are the people of God doing? But not just eating and drinking, it's identifying exactly what they're eating. Eating flesh, drinking wine, killing sheep, slaying oxen. What kind of diet is this? It's not a plant-based diet. <laughs> this is a flesh-based diet. Animal products. Drinking wine, fermented beverages. Double application, physical and spiritual. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we're going to die. What does God think about this? Verse 14. And it was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts, surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till you die, saith the Lord God of hosts. This iniquity, what iniquity? God is specific. This iniquity, what iniquity? Wait a minute, eating flesh food is iniquity? Is that what the Bible says? Oh, you thought that was only in councils on diets and foods. You thought that was only in ministry of healing. But you didn't see that here in the Bible, in the Word of God, God says that the eating of flesh here, animal products in the Day of Atonement, those that understand the investigative judgment, those that understand the purpose of the third angel, what it calls for, Bible says it's an equal. In other words, it's something, this, this is something that they know they should not be doing. They're purposely transgressing not only the law of God morally, but even the, God, the, the law of our physical organism, the, law, the laws of health. Now, I wonder, what causes the people to be doing this? Eating, drinking, intemperance, gluttony, serving their God, which is their belly. Because I read a statement that says that the people that is the congregation, don't normally rise higher than the standard that's set by the ministers or the leaders. And oftentimes the sin of the congregation can be traced right to the doorstep of the minister. So I wonder if the ministers are not practicing health reform, if the ministers are opposing diet reform, then it's no wonder that the congregation is in this such state. Where do they get this example from? Go with me to Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56. 
Wanting to bring out some final points. Isaiah 56, beginning in verse 10. Listen to what we're told here. Isaiah 56, verse 10, it tells us, His watchmen can see. Uh-oh, there's the first problem. Blind watchmen. What, what happens if the blind follow the blind? Both are destroyed together. So we can't look and say, well, Lord, I, I was following the preacher. I was following the ministry, the leadership. And they led me astray. Yes, that's, that's true, but I offered you ISAF. I offered you the Holy Ghost. I offered you my word. I, I died for you on the cross. You have no excuse. His watchmen are blind. They're all ignorant. They're all dumb dogs that cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. I wonder what allows these, or what causes these dumb dogs that do not bark, what causes them to be so sleepy? And lying down and loving to slumber. They eat too much, what else? Drunkenness, what else? Drugs, what else? We, we know all the answers. Overeating. Verse 11. Yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough. They are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his gain from his court. To what does that mean, for his own gain? It's just, it's, just for, it's just for the money. It's just for the cash flow. It's a good paycheck. It's the easiest job I could ever do and get a, get, get a nice salary. But the Bible tells us that they're greedy dogs. They can never have enough. The shepherds that can't understand, they look to their own way. Everyone for his gain from his quarter. Verse 12 says, Come, ye say they, I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more abundantly. So if this is what the ministers and shepherds are doing, then what about their congregations? If, if the ministers don't practice and believe and teach health reform themselves, then what can we expect from the sheep? As a matter of fact, when we talk about the cross of Christ, many of us just think, well, in the cross of Christ, we're just thinking of, well, we're just thinking of a tree, merely a tree in which Jesus hung on. That is the cross. But it's deeper than that. Many of us here don't realize how much we fight and oppose the cross of Christ in our experience. That when Jesus tells us to take up our cross daily and follow him, we don't really understand what that cross means. That cross is a symbol of self-sacrifice, self-denial. Because naturally we are very selfish and covetous. So what does God do for us in order to break up the fallow ground of our heart? The selfishness, that stony heart that we have. What does he do for us? What does he send us? Which represents the cross. Trial? What else? People, Anyone else? People that are worse off than we that we have to help, yes? Rebuke? Rebuke. Discord? Discord. <laughs> the word? Affliction. Affliction? Let me read something to you from, you want to write this down, this is Councils on Health page 433, paragraph 1. Councils on Health, page 40, 433. Again, Council on Health, 433, paragraph 1. I want you to notice the principle here. She says here, every true reform, every what kind of reform? True. true reform has its place in the work of the third angel's message. So understand that third angel's message Commandments of God in the faith of Jesus, there is true reform that comes with it. Now, of course, if there's a true reform, there's also a false reform. Let's go on. Especially does the temperance reform demand our attention and support. What kind of reform? Temperance, temperance reform. 
At our camp meetings, we should call attention to this work and make it a living issue. What, what kind of work? Temperance. Temperance at our camp meetings and make it a living issue. Which means it's a, it's, it's a testing question. It says we should present to the people the principles of true temperance. What kind of temperance? True, true temperance. So if there's true temperance, then there's a false, false temperance by default. True temperance and call for signers to the temperance pledge. Careful attention should be given to those who are enslaved by evil habits. We must lead them to the cross of Christ. Oh. So, what did she say here is associated with the cross of Christ? Temperance, Temperance reform. Now consider we're talking about those that are the enemies of the cross of Christ. It's a deeper meaning now. So what if we're fighting and opposing temperance reform? Is not God trying to lead us to the cross? Is he not calling us to take up our cross? Is temperance reform, is that a cross that we've been called to carry? Amen. Yes. Was Jesus himself temperate? Yeah. Yes, he was. Isaiah 7, 15 says, Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may not refuse the good and choose the evil. The other way refuse the evil, sorry, and choose the good. We're at the end. <laughs> Refusing evil and choosing the good. This is why he was temperate in his diet. So he can gain a moral victory over the flesh. So she tells us that temperance reform, diet reform, health reform is the cross. Many people by shunning health reform and temperance reform are not lifting up the cross. They're fighting against the cross and are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. Let's look at another statement. This is coming from volume one of the testimonies. Volume one of the testimonies. Page 524. So let me ask you this. So diet reform, temperance reform, this is the cross. And this is connected with the message. Matter of fact, when Paul preached the message to Felix and Drusilla, the Jewish, in Acts 24, verse 24 and 25, the Bible says that he reasoned with him of, of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. A threefold message. So you can't separate temperance from righteousness or judgment to come. He's given it to us to help us in the, to accept and experience righteousness by faith and be prepared for the judgment. And as a matter of fact, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus and will run by patience and want to get into the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And there's a problem there because if we're not patient, we can't keep the commandments of God. Nor experience the faith of Jesus. And what has God given to us in order to be patient Peter's ladder puts it this way, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, very good. So wait a minute, in order for me to have patience, what comes before patience in Peter's ladder? Temperance. So wait a second, so if I'm going to be patient, then I need what? So is this the reason why we're not why we're impatient, why we are irritable, why we get frustrated, why we have short fuses and tempers, tempers because, because tempers reform is being neglected. If we would gain the mastery, we would gain victory over self-mastery, we have to be temperate in how many things? All things. So temperance is connected with the third angel's message, and here is the patience of the saints. That's why it gives diet reform and health reform and temperance reform one of the reasons. But what also goes along with diet reform and health reform? Dress. Dress reform? I wonder now, is dress reform a cross? Is dress reform a cross? I would expect to hear more amens and yeses from the ladies out there. The men need to be dress reformers as well. Men is called, God has called men to do that as well. But especially 
with the ladies, with the women. Now, I want to read something to you. This is Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, page 523, 524. Listen to what she says here. She says, I was referred to Numbers 15, 38 to 41. Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe of the borders of a ribbon of blue and it shall be unto you a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them and that you seek not after your own, your own heart and your own eyes which after which you used to go a whoring, that you may remember and do all my commandments. And be holy unto your God. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Here God expressly commanded a very simple arrangement of dress for the children of Israel for the purpose of distinguishing them from the idolatrous nations around them. So question, why did God give them instruction regarding dress reform? Distinction, to be separate from the idolatrous nations that were around them. As they look upon their peculiarity of dress, they were to remember that they were God's commandment keeping people and that he had wrought in a miraculous manner to bring them from Egyptian bondage to serve him, to be a holy people unto him. So again, second point now, what was the ribbon of blue to remind them of? To keep the commandments of God. That God had called them out of Egypt, he called them out of the world that they're to be his peculiar people. So in other words, in their style of dress, it was to reflect the law of God or the character of his holiness. Continuing on. They were not to serve their own desires or to imitate the idolatrous nations around them, but to remain a distinct separate people that all who looked upon them might say, these are they whom God brought out of the land of Egypt who keep the, ten, the law of the Ten Commandments. An Israelite was to be known to be such as soon as seen. For God, for God through simple means distinguished him as his. So in other words, when someone looked at an Israelite, they already knew. They're an Israelite. They're a worshiper of God and not of idols. They keep the Sabbath. They're God's covenant people. These are the ones that he delivered from Egypt with signs and with wonders and great terror and plagues and judgments. These are his people. Amen. What about Seventh-day Adventists, modern Israel? Should people be able to look at a Seventh-day Adventist just by the way that they're dressed and be able to tell that, that yes. something's different about you? Amen. Just by how you're dressing. I don't see all the jewels and colorful cosmetics and adornment and all this worldly fashion. I don't, you, 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 the nails aren't painted, the fingernails aren't painted, the face is not all painted up, the eyes, all these things, men as well, to be different. And there was a time when you used to curtail, but unfortunately not anymore. No one can look at us and tell that we've been brought out of Egypt, and perhaps maybe it's because Truly, we've departed from God. We're rejecting his laws and we're, we're steadily retreating back to Egypt and Christ is no longer our leader, but rather the golden calf is before us, leading us back into Egypt. Enemies of the cross of Christ while professing to lift him up. Notice the order given by God to the children of Israel to place a ribbon of blue in their garments was to have no direct influence on their health only as God would bless them by obedience and the ribbon would keep in their memory the high claims of Jehovah and prevent them from mingling with other nations, uniting in their drunken feasts and eating swine's flesh and luxurious food detrimental to health. God would now have his people adopt the reformed dress not only to distinguish them from the world as his peculiar people, but because the reform in dress is essential to physical and mental health. God's people have to a great extent lost their peculiarity and have been gradually patterning after the world and mingling with them until they have in many respects become like them. This is displeasing to God. He directs them as he directed the children of Israel anciently to come out from the world and forsake their idolatrous practices, not following their own hearts, for their hearts are unsanctified, or their own eyes, which have led them to depart from God and to unite with the world. Now we're closing here on this point. So we're looking at the reasons why God gave dress reform. First to ancient Israel. Now we all say we're modern Israel, right? So then would it not also make sense that we too, men, women, children, all of us, 
would practice and would receive this reform. Now notice what she goes on to say in closing here. Something must arise to lessen the hold of God's people upon the world. The reform dress is simple and healthful, yet there is a cross in it. Did you hear what she said? There's a cross in it. Let me appeal to the ladies in here. Ladies, is there a cross in it? Amen. Yeah. Maybe not so for the men. Because the men can, if, if a man dresses the way he's supposed to be dressing, evenly clad, dressing as God would have him to dress, well, it's not so hard, so difficult. But what about a lady that's always wearing a skirt? Come on, ladies, let me appeal to you, ladies. You're wearing a dress all the time. Now, again, we're not just talking about at church. But we're talking about those that carry their religion outside of church outside of camp meeting, and every day they go out, this is the way that they are. There's some that have that experience, and I'm not condemning those that don't, but calling for us to study and to come up higher to examine ourselves. You notice that many times when people, the first thing they notice when they look at you, <laughs> is how you're dressed. You know it. You get the looks, you get the attention, and that, that could be in the world, but more so even in the church and even among other Adventist family members that don't practice these things like, man, every time I see her, she's always wearing this. And immediately in our mind, we're thinking, oh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to wear this because I don't want to be a fanatic. I don't want to be an extremist. I don't want to make people uncomfortable. This is, this is how we reason. I don't want people to talk about me. I don't want people to look at me strangely. There are women out there that go through this. Some of the sisters that go through this. Brethren, she just said very clearly that there's a cross in it. And you know what she says? I thank God for the cross and cheerfully bow to lift it. We have been so united with the world that we have lost sight of the cross and do not suffer for Christ's sake. Now listen, I didn't write that. Because someone would say, well listen, and I'm going to tell you something, God, God is awesome. You know why? Because before he called Ellen Harmon, he called two men. One man by the name of Hazen Foss, and another man by the name of William Foy. They had the gift of prophecy. They had the same visions as she had. He, chose, he, he came to a man first. One just flatly outright rejected, Hazen Falls. The other was declaring the visions of God and the message that he gave, but because of circumstances, racial prejudice and hardship caused that man not to be able to carry the work like he should have been able to do. God comes to a woman. Though they were all young men, but he comes to a woman. And it's like, well, Lord, well, why would you do that? Well, think about it. God's prophet was going to be more than just a prophet. God's prophet was going to write about education. She was going to write about family. She was going to write about marriage. She was also going to write about dress. And ladies, you know, and oftentimes you hear it. It's often said to men, what do you know about being a woman? You're being critical. You're being harsh. You don't know what it's like to be a woman. You don't know what I go through. Yes, and probably so. So think about it. God in his infinite wisdom had a woman, listen to me, had a woman write about dress reform. Just one woman say amen? I thought I would hear more amen from the ladies out there. Had a woman communicate to the women. Because you know if it was given by a man, you'd fight against it. Many people rebel against it, and it was a woman that wrote it. How much more if it was a man telling you how to dress? Even now, when, 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 if the minister even talks about dress, we start getting uncomfortable. Start moving and sh getting shifty and getting agitated and bothered when we, listen, we start talking about 
what's on the plate. We start talking about what's in the refrigerator and what's in the, in the closet. These are areas we're supposed to keep out of. You can preach the gospel, preacher, but this far have you come, but don't come no further. You want to make some enemies? Talk about these things I'm talking about. Brethren, she said it was a cross. And I'm saying to you tonight that we're talking about the enemies of the cross of Christ. And it's deeper than what we're thinking. God gives the reforms, health, diet, dress, reform. That's part of the cross Amen. to separate us from the world. Are we carrying the cross? Are we following our Savior whithersoever he goeth? Have we ever considered this and thought about this? That I myself, because my God is my belly, my appetites and passion and worldly fashion, that I could be opposing the cross of Christ by how I eat and drink and dress, my conversation, my lifestyle. In closing, she says, we should not wish to invent something to make a cross. Did you hear what she just said? Let me read it, read it again. We should not wish to invent something to make a cross. We should cheerfully, excuse me, we should not wish to invent something to make a cross, but if God presents to us a cross, we should cheerfully bear it. In the acceptance of the cross, we are distinguished from the world who loved us not and ridicule our peculiarity. Christ was hated by the world because he was not of the world. Can his followers expect to fare better than their master? If we pass along without receiving censure or frowns from the world. Listen, if we pass along without receiving censure or frowns from the world, we may be alarmed. For it is our conformity to the world which makes us so much like them that there is nothing to arouse their envy or malice. There is no collision of spirits. The world despises the cross. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but us which are saved, it is the power of God. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, 525. We're going to continue our studies, the enemies of the cross of Christ. And I'm praying, brethren, that as we lift up Jesus, as we lift up Calvary, let's not forget that with it, God has given us reforms. God gave them to us, not man. God gave it to us to separate us from the world, to purify us as a peculiar treasure, to help us to remember that we're to keep the commandments of God, that we're judgment bound. Jesus is coming soon, and there's a world to reach with the third angel's message. Not just in word, not in doctrine, but in our deportment, in our behavior, in our conversation. Our Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, we, we come before thee. Thanking you again for the Holy Gospel, for the Word of God, the Scriptures of Truth. We are desiring to uplift Jesus, to make him the great center of attraction of the third angel. You have told us that there are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame and they mind earthly things. We realize that these enemies of the cross of Christ are those that will end up rejecting the third angel's message, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, but even the patience of the saints, that which pertains to the reforms you've given us in diet, in dress, in health. And Father, I'm praying for moral stamina and strength that we would not be ashamed of the cross, that we would not shirk from it, but that we would, we would carry it and that you would help us to do it gladly. To remember Jesus and his self-denial and his self-sacrificing love. And that we as his followers are expected to do no, no less than what our master did. That we want to follow in his footsteps, in the blood-stained path, whose blood was shed for us on Calvary. The, the, the blood of Prince Emmanuel to stand upon and under his banner. Well, Father, we're praying for the Holy Spirit tonight to search our hearts and to help us not to be the enemies of the cross of Christ, 
but to lift up the cross, to draw people to the cross, that we could be crucified unto the world and the world unto us, that Christ can live and dwell in his people. This is my prayer and my desire for each and every one this evening, including myself as well. Bless us as we end this night, and may you give us sweet peace and rest tonight as we go back to our tents. And may there be great searching of heart, great studying of the Word of God, wrestlings with you in order that we might come into a place where we are surrendered to God and are at peace with God and accept the truth that you've presented to us, though it be a cross, but that we would gladly bear it and shoulder up and carry and cherish that old rugged cross and cling to it until someday we might be able to exchange it for a crown. In heaven we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.